we're at the library in Rio Rancho, and this is the display case for putting up my abacus exhibit. My friend Ethan's here to help us. Okay, let's do this. Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, today I had the opportunity to go out to the community of Rio Rancho, New Mexico. This is kind of a bedroom community northwest of Albuquerque. There is a library, a public library in Rio Rancho, the Esther Bone Library. I was invited to present a portion of my abacus collection, actually most of my abacus collection, into a display case. And my friend Ethan Moses helped me this morning put up this display, and it was a lot of fun. Let's cut to some of the footage. Well, the exhibit is up. Ta-da! So I didn't include every single artifact of my abacus collection in the display case. I was limited in room, so I did not include this 2.5 Chinese abacus, nor did I include this 9-bead homemade abacus that I made a few decades ago. And, of course, I didn't include the big 2.5 Chinese abacus, mainly because I didn't have room in the display case for it. But most every other abacus in my collection is there right now, including all of my Japanese Soroban. And, uh, you know, the display came out really good. I kind of was fretting uh, how well this would come out, and I had to do a lot of planning, probably for at least the last month, including I wanted some informational cards that described uh, about the history of the abacus, the various cultures that use them, the various types of abacus, and then I wanted a couple uh, cards about how simple addition is performed on the abacus and how numbers are represented. So these are the presentation foils for the exhibit. So the first foil is just an introductory one about what the abacus is, an ancient calculating device that uses either beads on rods in a wooden frame or counters on a board or table, and it derives from early tally systems of counting that date as far back as 8500 BC. So the abacus kind of passed from Greece to Rome to Central and East Asia over the last 2,000 years. There's three types of abacus that are generally still in use, the 10-bead shati, the 2-5 swan pond, which is the Chinese, and the 1-4 soroban in Japan. There's a few other variations of those. And this exhibit, of course, is from the private collection of Albuquerque native Joe Van Cleave. Okay, the second foil talks about the 10-bead abacus, and here I had basically two of my 10-bead abacus is on display. The Shati is the Russian 10-bead abacus. This is the one of the largest ones in my exhibit, and was taught how to use this in most Soviet-era schools up until the 1990s. And parts of Russia and Central Asia use this still in commerce alongside electronic cash registers. And it's related to the medieval European counting board, which was derived from the Roman counting board. The metal uh, rods are arched so that the beads stay put on one side of the abacus when they're moved. 
In the 1820s, when Napoleon invaded Russia, one of the French officers, uh, Jean-Victor Poncelet, was a POW in Russia, and when he was released at the end of the war, he brought back the ten-bead abacus to France, where it became a school children's device for instruction. And so the one on the right here in this foil is an example of one of those. And that ten bead abacus was brought to America uh, afterwards, and that's where we get the school children's ten bead abacus here. And it's considered the easiest form of abacus to use. The next foil is the Chinese abacus, uh, known as the swan pond. It's, it's the generally the 2-5 orientation two beads on each rod above the bar, five beads below. Uh, so it was thought that it was brought to the uh, East Asian area via Rome from uh, the trading routes around the 12th century. The Roman version used clay balls and a grooved tablet, and of course because of the materials in East Asia, China evolved to using wooden beads on a wooden frame. You can count up to 15 on each rod, which enables base 16 currency. An old, ancient version of Chinese currency was based on base 16. You can also do what's called Chinese iron division, a version of division that requires you to enter more than a value of 10 on each place value. And it also allows you to enter multiple numbers uh, on each rod before rationalizing the result. In the 16th century, Japan uh, inherited the Chinese abacus and quickly became the 1-5 Soroban. The 2-5 version is still used in parts of China and East Asia. The next uh, foil is about the Japanese Soroban. So as I said, it evolved from the Chinese 2-5 version in the 16th century. And early in the 20th century, it was modernized to become the 1-4 version, where you only need to represent values from 0 through 9 on each row. Generally, the Japanese Soroban have the highest level of craftsmanship and artistry in design and construction. The Japanese intensively taught the Soroban in schools since the early 20th century, and they also developed a competitive ranking system of like level of dan similar to martial arts and there's also officially licensed soroban operators and one thing that the 1-4 modern soroban enables is mental abacus calculations where a operator will imagine the five beads in their mind and can actually do complex mental calculations with a mental abacus. The 1-4 Japanese Soroban has also spread to East and South Asia, including Singapore and India, and it's also recognized in Japan as an important Japanese cultural art form. So here are the next foil. I present a simple foil on how to do counting from 1 through 9 on the 1-4 Soroban as the lower beads, which represent a value of 1 each when they're moved toward the bar, the upper bead is a value of 5 as it's moved down, and in combination they can represent values from 5 to 9, as you can see here. Okay, the next foil is a simple addition problem using the Soroban. So the problem on the left is 1 plus 3. And in this uh, problem, you simply see that you move up the one bead toward the bar, and then you move up the three beads to make a total of four. So a lot of abacus calculations are not that simple because you don't have as many beads as you'd like. And this next problem is an example of that. This is the problem of three plus four. So in step A, we raise three one beads. And now we find for step B of adding four, we don't have four additional one beads. So what we do is called a complementary problem, which is we subtract the fives complement of four, which is one, while adding a five bead. So you can see on step B, we bring down a five bead and we bring down a one bead. The answer is seven. And we do that all in one motion using the index finger. You swipe down the five bead and swipe down that one bead in a quick motion. So the answer is seven, a five and a two bead. And this is an example of a fives complement problem. So this last foil is an example of 
having to use both fives complements and tens complements in a problem. And this kind of complication arises frequently. So this is the problem of six plus seven. Now there is a shortcut to doing this, which I'll show you soon. Okay, so we enter six on the unit's rod in step A by pushing down a five bead and sliding up a one bead. So there's six. Now we want to add seven, but we can see that we don't have seven left on that rod. So we have to do a tens complement problem. We have to add a 10 bead on the next rod to the left, and we also have to subtract 3, which is the tens complement of 7. The problem is we don't have 3 1 beads on the unit's rod. We only have a 5 and a 1 bead. In order to subtract the 3, we're going to have to do a 5's complement problem. But in order to explain this a lot more simply, it is simply this. When you have these problems that encompass both fives and tens complements within the same problem like this, all you have to do to add the seven to the six is push the seven up. So if you see in the middle step on this foil, step B, we've pushed up a five bead and we've pushed up two one beads at the same time using our index finger and our thumb. And together, those three beads have a value of seven. So we're pushing seven up. Then we have to also enter the 10 bead to the left, the next rod to the left, right? And that gives us a value of 13, which is the answer. So when you have these fives and tens complements problems and you can't directly do the tens complement step itself, you do the pushing up the number trick. So these were just examples of how um, simple addition problems can be done on the on the abacus, on the specifically on the 1-4 Soroban. And together all of these foils which I presented in the display uh, gave an, kind of a basic historic overview of the abacus, the different types of abacus that are in use, and basically how numbers are represented and how simple addition is performed. So this exhibit is going to be at the Esther Bone Library in Rio Rancho, New Mexico during the month of April. And I'm hoping if you happen to be in the area, drop on by and take a look at it and let me know what you think of it down below. And there also might be an opportunity for me to do a talk at the library sometime this month. And if that happens, I'll also let you know. Well, if you're interested more in the abacus, I have a number of abacus videos, and I'll drop a link down below to the playlist of those. And also, I have at least one or two more videos coming up soon about abacus mathematics and, and arithmetic, and especially addition, how to make it easier for us adult brains to figure out, to start out. If you want to start out learning how to use the Japanese Soroban, I have some interesting ideas for making it easy to understand. So look forward to those videos in the future. And in the meantime, I wish you guys well, stay creative, and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.